again. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Here we are, another beautiful Sabbath day. Saw the beautiful colors coming down, starting to become more brownish and yellowish. But autumn is a very colorful type of season, and it's very nice coming down, beautiful weather. And again, it's good to see everybody, and although I can't see you, you can see me. Welcome again to those online. <laughs> everybody here says hi to you as well, so... Welcome. Ephesians 6, verse 12, please. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Let's turn there. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We wrestle against evil. We stand against evil. We can, as human beings, if we're not careful, we can be succumbed by that evil. As members of the body of Christ, we have to always be aware and praying, as Paul tells us to pray always, that we don't, are not succumbed to the ways of the world. That's why, you know, we were talking before services, and it just, it's a feeling. You know, this week, I can only speak on I pray. When I speak, I pray and I ask God to help guide, and, and boy, this week am I tired. <laughs> I'm tired. I was so glad the Sabbath arrived. Uh, some of us have good weeks, some of us have not so good weeks. They're up and down and based on um, what our circumstances are, but oh, I could feel it ever since we got back from the feast, just and as I made mention of announcements. It's just like a, a heaviness in the world uh, for God's people that we know what's coming. We see it. It's here. And we know who we wrestle against. We know we go against rulers of the darkness of this age. As Peter puts it in 1 Peter 5, let's go to 1 Peter 5. First Peter 5, there we go. Peter writes it like this. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, he says, Be sober. That means be self-controlled. Be vigilant. That means be watchful. You know, our Savior said that, Matthew 24, watch and pray. Now, I said in all the Gospels, you can see it in Luke 21, watch and pray. But Peter, because Peter was there, he heard it. From the, he was standing there when he heard that from our Savior. Be sober, be vigilant. Or it just says, be self-controlled and be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he would more than love it to take us out and devour us. That's why we have to be sober, be vigilant, be in prayer. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith, Peter says. It means we need to stand tall in what we know is true and what we've been taught, whether it's the commandments, the holy days, the weekly Sabbath, Whatever, from God's word to our ears. It says, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The body of Christ has been, is, and will be under attack from our enemy. And we have to stand tall. Stand tall. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, be Christ Jesus, after you have suffered, suffered a while, Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. As I just made mention, our spiritual battle is tiring. We live in the world. We work in the world. We do things in the world. And our enemy sees us. And to stand tall in Christ, it, it, that, that warfare, it is warfare. That's what it is. Because if we would to a continue to read in Ephesians, Paul talks about the armor of God. That's not today's message, is the armor of God, but it is a warfare, 
And it's one that we need to take seriously because it does beat on us. I'm not going to go into detail, but we had a rough week at work this week. It, it was. It was tiring. It was hard. And it, you know, could it be because of our stand in faith and because who we are? And, you know, it gets to the point and you sometimes think, oh, that's enough. I'm just, I'm tired. But we cannot be tired in the word of God. Or strive not to be anyway, because he says right here, Paul, I mean, not Paul, Peter says, God is with us. He will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. <clears throat> as long as we are steadfast in the faith. There are times, I'm physically this week, could I keep going on? I'll be honest with you. And some of us have had weeks like that. Some of us have had days like that. It was just like, oh man, I just, that was tiresome. What happened? But in the realm of spiritual and what we know, we have to keep going. It's called endurance. It's called perseverance. It's having the will to keep going on even in the face of extreme challenges. And understanding the challenge we face is for a little time and that we need to continue on the path that we've been called to be on, that God has put us on. It's bigger than us. And we have to remember that. I have to remember that. I forget that too some days. You're like, I don't like I'm just I'm tired. <laughs> but prayer helps. Looking back and meditating helps. Understanding to put Christ in us certainly helps when we're down and we are tired. And remember who we are and what our job is. The quickest way to fall and stumble and be beyond tired to say no thank you anymore is to stop praying. Is to stop reading. Is to stop meditating on God's word. And stop looking to Christ, who is our, our captain of our salvation, who is our mediator. John 6, verse 27. Let's go to John 6. As you're turning there, if we lose our focus, then we become like the world. If we lose our focus and we're tired and we give up and we just go with the flow of the world, then we just might as well go back into the world but that's not who we are. That's not who we are. God has seen something in each one of us that says, yes, they can keep going. They just rely on me, trust in me, God says, and I will get them where they need to be. John 6, verse 27, he says, Do not labor for f food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Turn to Christ. Christ, his own word says, I will give you that spiritual food. I will give you that spiritual food. Same chapter, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In verse 48, he repeats it. I am the bread of life. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, about six months from now, we'll read these verses again. The days of unleavened bread, the Passover, the Lord's Supper. But as I said, it's just kind of interesting like us, God, how God works. We come here and we're having a conversation and we kind of talked about you know, the feeling that we have after the feast. Feast was a great time, great feast, wonderful. We don't like to see the feast end. We go back into the world and it's just you can feel it. And it can weigh down. We have a weekly Sabbath. Here we are on the weekly Sabbath. And I know Tom gave us a message about the drinking, the watering hole a couple years ago about how the Sabbath is our watering hole. We get here every week to replenish and we pray that God will bless us so we can be replenished. And we can go back, and not that we can, we have to, go back into the world and do it all over again for six days. You know, go back in the world, do it again for six days. 
And then just asking God for help and guidance and love through Jesus Christ. Christ sustains us, gives us that spiritual bread, that spiritual nourishment to get us up and get us going. Let's go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Of who he was and who he is. And what he did and does and continues to do for us. 1 Peter 2 verse 21, Peter writes, For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So when we get in doubt and we're tired, we look to Christ. What was his example? What did he do? What did he show us through scripture? Who committed no sin, nor is deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. One of the quickest human emotions is revenge. Get back at them. They did me wrong. I want to get them back. And we can see that, that feeling in the world. And if we're not careful, we, we can succumb to that because nobody wants to be done wrong. Nobody wants to be done wrong. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him. He committed himself to the Father who judges righteously. That's his example. As we're living our life as true Christians, we have to be different. If we revile in return or if we threaten somebody, if we suffer because of some injustice, we're no better than the world. We're no better than our enemy. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. That we might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter writes that. Have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Starts with Christ, there is Christ. There he is. We should need to remember to come before him. And it's hard to do. But especially when we're beat on, when we're tired. Some days you just want to go to bed and hide your head and just say, leave me alone. <laughs> you do. But that's not who we are. That's not who we are. Second Corinthians verse, uh, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Paul writes about this. Paul saw it happening in the churches of the day, of his day. So he wrote, he was inspired to write, to be that cheerleader. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Remember that? We have the Spirit of God in us if we've been baptized. And hands laid upon us. We have the Spirit of God in us. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. We are the ex- we we carry it on. That's what we're asked to do. When we're asked, when we're told to be the lights, when we're told to be the ambassadors, we are told to carry on what we've been taught. The words of Christ. Also, may be manifest in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And that's a struggle. As human beings, there's times we want to lose heart. 
enough's enough. You know, ring the bell. What's that? Throw the white towel in. If a boxer, they throw in the towel. I'm done. Ring the bell. Or, you know, when armies surrender, raise the white flag. But that's not who we are. That's not who we're called to be. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And we remember that by going in prayer and asking for renewal that God would strengthen us. And we believe that. We believe that he hears us and that he will renew us day by day for our light affliction. And sometimes I smile at that because sometimes it doesn't feel light. Things that we go through, things that we struggle with on a daily basis as human beings. But Paul writes this, for our light affliction... And Paul's writing on the basis of the grander picture, of the bigger picture, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. That's where our focus is. Our focus on the things we have not seen, have not been on this earth yet, we cannot see them. That is our hope, and that's our vision. We look at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse 1 of the next chapter, we're going to continue with his thought. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. That's what we yearn for. Is, you know, we pray for the kingdom to come. That we can find that immortality and have that immortality. <clears throat> That's what Paul's writing about there. And he says in verse 5, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. We cannot forget that. The baptized members of the body of Christ cannot forget that. We have his Spirit in us. It's beautiful. It's a guarantee. And it just makes us so much closer to the Father through Jesus Christ that we can come before and ask, Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews 3 verse 1, says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, see this, I think Paul wrote this letter, some people disagree, but I think Paul wrote this letter, Paul's writing and says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. He says, look at Christ. Who was faithful to him who appointed him. As Moses was also was faithful in all his house. Christ was faithful to the Father. We look to Christ. Verses 5 and 6. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We have to hold fast. Hold on. Hold on. Hold fast. Hold like we've never held before. We know, we see what's coming. We know what's going to arrive. It's here already, at the doorsteps, through the doorstep, through the door. I don't you know, it just... Things are happening before our eyes faster and faster and faster. I, I, when Tom was here and he was talking about his message, and I know they heard it in Myrtle Beach and Branson and whoever, he goes, does it feel like time is flying by getting faster? And I'm, I'm back there shaking my head, yes. He's looking at, he looked at me, I, yeah, yeah. It's also the pressure. He's correct. I'm sitting back there as a science teacher. I said, he's got this exactly right. That Boyle's Law. The pressure's building. The pressure's building. Time's getting faster. And we have to hold on to what we know is true. 
We have God's promise. It's amazing how God just shows things to all of us. Tom, you, all of us, through, through simple formulas and nature, how God created nature and all those things. That's just a side note. As a science, science teacher, scientist, it's amazing God's hand. It's just, it's just, it's just amazing. Hebrews 3, verse 12. He says, Hebrews 3, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Paul warns. So we have to look at ourselves. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Look at ourselves daily. Where's our heart? Where's our mind? Are we still following what we've been taught? It's for all of us. Me, you, anybody who's listening to the voice, wherever this message lands and wherever it gets sent out. Beware, brethren. Beware. In verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. We're here to help each other and tell each other. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We can be hardened. We can lose our focus. For if we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold, for we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Steadfast to the end. Hold fast. Hold firmly. That's a verb. That's an action word. To hold. Fast is an adverb. I don't teach ELA, but I, do, I did teach a little ELA because I used to teach the younger kids a little bit. It's an action word, to hold, to bear down, to stay the course. Continue to believe in or adhere to an idea or principle. What's the, when times get tough, one needs to hold fast and write it out. I know the other saying is when things get tough, the tough get going. I've never been through a hurricane, but I've seen the devastation. Well, they're on TV, but I've been to New Orleans, and I still see the devastation that's still there, 2005 in Katrina. I can't imagine holding on for dear life in a hurricane. I can't imagine that. When Tom talks about the water coming through his door, last summer he, I went over to his house, and he showed me. He showed me of this past hurricane, not, not Katrina, but the one that came through last year. The water coming through the door and the seams of the door. And I'm like, I just, you just shake your head, and like, unbelievable. The power of a hurricane. I can't imagine. Never been through a hurricane. Been through severe thunderstorms before, but nothing like that. Adhere to an idea or principle. What idea or principle do we hold true? Which ones do we hold, to, hold fast to and hold firm to? Some synonyms to stay strong, to do what is right. To see it through, no surrender. Stay true. Continue to believe. This too shall pass. Grit it out. As a human, that's hard to hang on to. Without Christ, without God, there is no, there's no hope. There's no hanging on for what's coming and is here down the pipe, coming down the pipe. The goofiness that we see in the world today, that's what I say goofiness. It's evil. You just, I'm trying to be friendly here, friendly words, it's just goofy. Things we've never seen before. Mind-boggling decisions that, and words that come out of speeches and things, just, it's goofy. I've never, you know, we've never seen things like that. But as God's people, we know that it's supposed to happen. It's going to happen. As we said, let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 23, says, let us hold fast. Hold fast. There it is again. Hold fast. The confession of our hope without wavering. Without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We have to believe that. We know it's to be true. We cannot let go of that promise. We cannot let go of that promise. 
that he will be there. We may have to go through things. We may have to suffer through things. But he's there. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as we see, as you see, the day approaching. The day is approaching. How are we going to act? How are we going to behave? Are we going to hold fast? Are we going to come before God and be honest with him and say, you know, I'm, I'm still weak. I'm still weak, Father. Help me. There's days I wake up and I, I see the news. And I, this is me talking. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know. We're going to see things. We're seeing things we've never seen. We're going to continue to see things we've never seen in human history. Are we ready? I don't know. There's days. I days I'm honest. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to see things. That's why the scripture says, blessed are those who rest, who have died. Scripture says that. Blessed are those. I'm paraphrasing it, but Scripture says, blessed are those who are in their graves. Their fight's over. They've won the victory. But we are to stay strong and keep going and endure. Keep going. Need of endurance, steadfastness to continue and not to reject the law, not to reject Christ. It says in verse 35, Hebrews 10, 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And what's the will of God? To walk with Him in truth and in justice. That's His will. To give Him the glory and to rely on Him. He said that to ancient Israel when they came out of Egypt. Would you just, he told them at the Red Sea, just stand back and watch what I'm going to do for you. Jesus, he told Joshua as he went to Jericho. Christ told the apostles, go out and preach. Take nothing with you. You'll be fine. First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 58. So he, wrap up, he wraps up this, this thought because he's talking about the resurrection and the coming of Christ. First Corinthians 15, verse 58, he says, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He says that. Knowing. Just above the verse, above it, verse 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The pathway to victory is Christ. We can never forget that. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, God knows what we're doing. We're in his work. We're doing what he's asked us to do, told us to do, commanded us to do. Be those lights to each other, but to the world as well. That is what we're told to do. Trust in God. Allow him to direct our paths. Yeah, and we are going to be tested. Yes, we are. We're going to be tempted too. Tempted by our enemy. We're going to be tested by God. He tested them in ancient Israel. I think it was at the feast. I gave a message that it said, He tested them. It, you lack not. Yeah, it was at the feast. You lack nothing. We lack nothing. He told ancient Israel, I did this for, you went through this 40 years. These things happened to you to see, I tested you to see if you would love me with all your heart, with all your soul. He's going to test us. That's his right to test us, to see where we stand. We're also going to be tempted. Our enemy would love to see us fall. And become so tired that we give up, that we do go hide in that bed, that spiritual bed, the covers over our heads, just leave me alone. 
Recent times, do you think we've been tested? Well, yeah, I think so. Are we continually tempted by our enemy? Yeah, we are. And it will continue to be that way till our Savior returns. Or, you know, not to think I don't want anybody to die, we pass away. And we're in the grave. But we, in this life, in this life, we are to continue to walk in Christ. Colossians 2, Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. This is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Are hidden. Christ knows it all, is all, so is the Father. Reminds me of the time that Christ turns to the disciples. He, he lost uh, many of them because they were upset and angry and they were disgusted by what he said about you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they left. And he turned to the twelve because you're going to leave me too? It's in the Gospels. He goes, you're going to leave me too? Peter goes, where are we going to go? You're the one. You're the Christ. You're the one that we need to follow. Verse 4, Colossians 2, verse 4, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He's telling them, you are steadfast in Christ, keep doing it. Keep going. Be, continue to be steadfast in Christ. Because he see, it says, I see your good order. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. We have a treasure beyond anything. We do. We have a treasure behind anything. What's the, 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 the pearl of great price? That was a Sabbath school topic a few years ago at the feast. That great pearl. The person sold all that he had to buy that, you know, to get that pearl. And he hid it. We have the knowledge of God, His truth. And that should bring us peace of mind. It should, if we allow it to. And it's hard. I'm not, I'm not saying this is easy to do. Because as human, our human nature, our human nature wants to kick in and say, no, I'm too tired. I give up. I'm going to go hide beneath the covers. Leave me alone. Steadfastness of your faith in Christ. I know I'm rereading verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. We've come out of the world. And we can turn and see that the world offers nothing. But we can be deceived. It says this right here. He's, Paul is giving another warning. We can be allowed to be deceived and go back in the world and be like the world and treat each other or treat others in the world like the world treats themselves. And it says, and not according to Christ. For in him, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. He's saying, don't forsake Christ. We know, he's that's what Paul's saying. Second Peter, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter chimes in. 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, verse 12. And I, I just, I've, over the past several months, maybe a year, I just love this verse. Because I don't know why it rings with me. I don't know. Because maybe I'm hard-headed some days. I don't know. And my wife's shaking her head back there. And I agree with her. There's days I'm hard-headed. 
Well, it, it's, it, it's a stubbornness, I think. It's human nature that we think we can overcome by ourselves. Oh, I got this. I got it. Don't worry. I can overcome. Then we fall flat on our face and we realize that, no, we couldn't without Christ or without the Father. That's a human nature thing. It's just more prevalent in others than some. 2 Peter 1, verse 12 says, For this reason I will, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. We do know the truth. We're established, but sometimes we do get forgetful or stubborn or hard-headed. And we think that we can do things without Christ. Or we think we know, hey, I don't need to, I don't need to read this again. And I say we, I, I'll raise my hand, I, I raise my hand. This message is, I think, a reason for all. I mean, it's for me too. Because of what's coming, of who we are. Because if we go back to verse 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And I know I'm not reading all of it. Go back and read 2 Peter 1, all of it. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then that's where I picked up verse 12. That he, he, Peter said, I will be, not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Even though you know the truth and you're established, Peter said in his life he was going to continue to remind, 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 remind. It says in verse 13, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter was there. He saw Christ. He t hugged Christ. He, you know, he was there. He was the one that denied him three times. And he came to the realization that we have to be reminded Reminded, reminded. He lived it. He was the one that pulled the sword and said, let's go. And later that night, he denies Christ three times. We've all been there. Where we fall. We think we're strong. And we falter. And we stumble. Peter lived it. That's why Peter says that. And it's been there for us to remind us. He says in verse 16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were, I, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For privacy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's from God. God's in control. God is there. And God will let us know what Scripture says. God will reveal to his saints what is to come. Second Peter 3. Second Peter 3. Second Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works therein it will be burned up. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Peter lays it on the line. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He didn't say what manner of persons ought you to be according to the world. No. 
holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Oh, we pray that. I think we all pray that. Please remember your promise, Father, what you said in Matthew 24, Christ tells us, for the, for the elect's sake, time will be cut short. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteous, righteousness dwells. We do look for that. That's a great time. That's why we have a great time at the feast. It's a preview of things to come. Preview of things to come spiritually. It says in verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that this long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. They're all on one page. All the apostles are on one page. Even Paul. Paul, you know, in his writing said, look at me, I'm the one out of season. I wasn't there with the other 12. But Christ blessed him. Christ took Paul out to the wilderness and taught him for a while. They're all on one page. It says in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Stay with what we know is to be true. Stay with what we know. Be steadfast. We've read that how many times? I, don't, I, haven't, I, didn't, I didn't count. What? Several times we've read steadfastness or hold fast. Turn away from, make sure we don't let the wicked into our minds and our hearts. And again, as humans, only human, if we're only, you know. But again, that's not who we are. Yes, we're human. But those who have been baptized and hands laid upon us, we have a peace of the Father in us. We have some of that spiritual in us, and we are held to that higher standard. We are held to that higher standard. And as Peter says, I'm going to remind you. I'm going to remind you. As Peter reminded me. I'm not saying that. I, I, don't, no, I don't put myself up. No. I'm just reading Peter's words that he was inspired to write. More words of Peter. First Peter 4. I just think, you know, Peter has some great words because he lived it. He was inspired. He was there when Christ was on the earth. First Peter 4, verse 12. First Peter 4, 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's what he's saying. He says, on their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. He's saying, don't do those things. What he's saying. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. In verse 17, it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Judgment comes to begin at the house of God. And it begins with us first. What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? See, the, again, the apostles are on one page. Paul's writings connect with Peter's. John's connects with Peter's and Paul's and all these apostles. It says in verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Commit to him. Be strong in him. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. 
verse 24. First Corinthians 9, verse 24, Paul writes, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? We're in a race. We're trying to get to that kingdom. But one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it, because he's, he's comparing this, like the Olympics to what we're doing. That's what he's comparing it to. He saw the sports and the things happening in you know, that time, his age in Rome and all that. That's what he's talking about. They do it for a, t for a perishable crown. But we, for an imperishable crown. We do it for an imperishable crown. And he says in verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. That's Paul talking. Well, all of us speakers take that to heart. The words are for all of us, including me and the other speakers. And we have to discipline our bodies, spiritual bodies, so we're focused. We don't run without, you know, he says, I run thus, not with uncertainty. We, he wants to run with certainty. That we're, I'm going. I know where I'm going. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 1. This is one of the many reasons I think Paul has, did write the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, again, poorly translated, it should be tree, that's what he was on, was a tree. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All that's in us, with the God as our help, Christ as our help, we need to throw away the sins that still ensnare, ensnare us. It's not easy to do. That's why we have a yearly reminder in the spring, six, less than six months from now, when we go through the Lord's Supper, the Passover service, and the Days of Unleavened Bread to find every nook and cranny that has a sin. To be better, because it can ensnare us. Just like the peanut butter I put on mouse traps. I'm saying, all of a sudden that mouse, got it, oh, well, too late, sorry for you. Ensnared it quickly. As we look at these things, we look at Christ, he's our example of endurance and overcoming. He was always in prayer. Read through the Gospels. In the, the, one, in the book of John, at the end it says, they didn't write down everything he did. How many minutes a day was he in prayer? We read a lot that he was in prayer a lot. That's that communication piece. In prayer as our example of endurance. 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4, verse 6. This is kind of Paul's farewell message. You know, Peter kind of gave his. He says, I, I'm going to make sure you have a reminder. Second Timothy 4, Paul is writing to Timothy in verse 6. says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All his appearing. Paul writes that. I've said this many times, one of the favorite ones, and I probably haven't gone there enough lately. Joshua, just the, Joshua chapter 1. It's probably that mindset, I know it, I know it, I know it, but it's good to reread it, be reminded. And see, that's, that's that stubbornness, that, well, I guess you could call it arrogance too. Like, I know it already. Well, do, do I? I'm talking, I'm talking about myself. Do you really know it? Joshua chapter 1, all the times that the Lord God told Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. He has to remind Joshua. Remind him, remind him. Joshua 1, verse 9, have I not commanded you? The Lord God's telling him, have I not already told you this? Have I not already commanded you many times? I've said this, you know, said it, said it, said it, said it. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Where were they going? Where were they going? To the promised land. That's where they were going. In verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves. Prepare yourselves, he told them. Get ready. Prepare. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Get ready. Be prepared. Because we're going in. That's what Joshua told the commanders, the officers, and then the officers told the people, get yourself ready. If you want to get in there, uh, that's prophetic. Yeah, that is. We've got to get ourselves ready and be prepared. If we can get ourselves prepared physically, I think so. I mean, I, I wholly, totally, wholly agree what Tom has been saying, other people have been saying. Get yourselves ready. Get, get the food. Get this. Get that. But we also have to be spiritually ready, too. I said earlier, there's times I wake up and say, I don't know if I'm ready to face what's coming. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but maybe you have thought that too. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know. Maybe you, I don't know. All we can do is, I mean, we pray, we ask God's help, and God's there. We can see the examples. Like I said, I've never been through a hurricane. I can't imagine going through a hurricane. I can't imagine. I hear the stories. I can see the evidence left behind. I can't imagine. Or I've never felt an earthquake. But people have lived through earthquakes. People have died because of earthquakes. People have gone through earthquakes. I can't imagine. We've been through disease. We've been through disease the past couple years. We're still, that's still hanging on and clinging to the human race. And now, as I said, I think I said it last week on the live stream, I, I can't imagine over in Harvard, I think, or is it Boston University, they're mixing variants together. To, um, yeah, let's just let that one get out too. But again, that's a side note. That's a side note. The things that we are facing. Have I not commanded you, the Lord God said? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And part of that is up in verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according 
to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Again, where are we going? Where were they going? It's a question to ask. Joshua 22, verse 5. Joshua 22, verse 5, says, But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. just so that we can connect the Old with the New Testament. It's there too. It's throughout the Bible. Hold fast. Hold fast to God. And He will guide us. But we have to, as it says right here, walk in all His ways. Walk in all His ways. Joshua 23, verse 8. Joshua 23, verse 8 says, But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. I know he's talking, Joshua's talking to the nation of Israel. They're in there. It's a reminder for us today. But he says in verse 9, he's a reminder for the people then in verse 9, For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. If God is with us, who can be against us? Right? That's what New Testament verse. Romans 8 says, who can separate us from the love of God? Then the Lord God drove out the nations before them. We, if, if we allow him to do it, he'll drive away the things, the temptations away from us. But we have to allow him. We see the condition. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Do the will of God. Keep his commandments. Remember who we are. Remember. Here's another synonym as we're coming to a close here today. I talked about some synonyms up earlier. Another one is anchored. Anchored. Are we anchored to our Savior? Are we anchored through Him to the Father? Let's talk about hurricanes, talk about storms. Are we anchored to the truth that we know and we hold so true? Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Anchor to God. A synonym for that is ironclad. Ironclad, if you're ironclad, it's so firm or secure as to be unbreakable. Binding, an ironclad oath. That's the promises God makes to us. His promises do not break. His promises will not break. His plan is in motion. But we have to strive hard as humans, as having part of the Holy Spirit in us to be a part of that ironclad oath and those promises. Having no obvious weakness, an ironclad, like as an example, as like an ironclad case in a courtroom against a defendant. It's ironclad. There's no way it's going to lose. Ironclad. Final scripture. Let's go to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings, 2 Kings 18. Let me wrap up today.
And for those of you, like myself, I can't find a second Kings comes after first Kings. Slit. Because obviously, I didn't remember that. There it is. There's second Kings 18. I would say before third Kings, but there's no such thing as third Kings. It's first Chronicles. But anyway, second Kings 18, verse 5. Talking about King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. 2 Kings 18, verse 5. It says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. What a great compliment. King Hezekiah. Because think about that for a moment. So that after him, none was like him among the kings. Oh, okay, I got that. But did you catch? Nor who were before him. Oh, who was before King Hezekiah? King David? King Solomon? Hmm. What a great compliment the Lord gave to King Hezekiah. Because you know why? Again, we can read it. He trusted in the Lord. He held fast to the Lord. And he kept his commandments. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm tired. Some of us get tired. And we do. I need a reminder. That's probably why God said you're going to speak on this. Because I needed a reminder. We're going in in times we've never seen, things we've never seen before. We continue to do so. They're just prophecies coming alive. Things are coming alive before our eyes. And we're going to get tired, physically tired, but we can't become spiritually tired. Or if we feel spiritually tired, we know what to do. It's been outlined because God's promise is awesome. He will be there if we allow him to be. He says to us, come to me, hold on to me, let me help, and you will prosper according to my truth and way. That's what he is saying. We've read many scriptures today that says that, but we have to keep going. We can't turn or can't become like the world because, nope, that's, we read several scriptures like that today. We've got to, let us continue to bear down, hold on, and be anchored, holding fast. Whatever, whatever synonym I threw out there you want to use, let it become a catchphrase with us in our head, whatever that may be, because we have to find ourselves securely attached, anchored, walking with, hand in hand, with both our Father in heaven and our older brother, Jesus Christ. As it said in Hebrews, as we see the day approaching. 